Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Audrey Stewart, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to welcome you to tonight with Emily Anthens discussing her latest book, The Gray Indoors, The Surprising Science of How Buildings Shape Our Behavior, Health, and Happiness. And she is joined tonight in conversation by Carl Zimmer. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring our authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. Every week we're hosting events here on our Zoom page. And as always, our event schedule will appear on our website at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk, go to the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you would like to buy a copy of The Great Indoors, there will be a link in the chat when, where you could purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you, especially during this difficult time for community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link for donation in the chat if you would like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever supports the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you again for tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced during virtual gatherings these last few months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thanks in advance for your patience and your understanding. Now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Emily Anthes is a science journalist and author. Her previous books include Frankenstein's Cat, Cuddling Up to Biotech's Brave New Beasts, and Instant Egghead Guide. In addition to two books, her articles have appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Boston Globe, Slate, Business Week, and so, so many more not to mention her long list of awards for her science journalism. She's joined tonight in conversation by Carl Zimmer, who is the author of no less than 13 books about science. He is also the author of a weekly column in the New York Times called Matter. In addition to his multiple awards, he also has a tapeworm named after him. Tonight, they're discussing Emily's new book, The Great Indoors. This book is a unique exploration into the habitat we human beings have created for ourselves. This beautiful and impeccably researched book explores how architecture and interior design affects our everyday existence, from our mental health to our physical health to the possibilities of a better future. The Wall Street Journal called it an engaging survey of the science behind of buildings and a reported account of the quest to improve life by deliberate design, a compelling science-based argument for the wisdom of intelligent design. And on that note of praise, I'll turn things over to our authors. Carl, Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, thanks for having us and hosting. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, Emily, I, um, I really enjoyed the book very much. And um, I have to say, w one of the things that um, captivated me was that, you know, there's this, um, you know, long tradition of, you know, books about, um, places like nature writing, you know, I'm going to write a book about the cloud forest or, 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 or the ocean or the Himalayas. Um, and you really took sort of like the indoors and made it this place, made it this, this uh, strange world that um, you were going to introduce us to, even though like here we are in inside. Um, and I, I'm sort of curious how you um, got the idea to, to write a book like this or was it, I mean and have you looked around your four walls a lot and <laughs> always wondered what's going on here or or was there another kind of origin story to a book like this yeah well I'm I'm glad you uh, mentioned the sort of expedition sense you got from it because that was sort of something I was going for you know if the BBC were to make a David Attenborough narrated documentary about our homes what would it be like was something I thought about a lot uh, but in terms of my interest, I am, as I acknowledge in the book, indoorsy. I was an indoorsy kid. I liked to be inside reading rather than, you know, out hiking. Um, but the research that really got me interested in this area was research on the indoor microbiome. 
And it was nearly a decade ago that I started to see some of these studies coming out of scientists going into homes and classrooms and public restrooms, and they would, you know, swab around a little bit of dust and sequence all the DNA it contained. And I found their findings kind of astounding in their own right. Um, you know, one study found that the average home had something like 2,000 different species of microbes, which was just mind boggling to me. But it also made me realize that, you know, for all the time I spent indoors, I didn't really know all that much about it. And that these environments were much richer and more complex than I had thought or given them credit for. So that was sort of the spark that made me realize, well, like what else am I taking for granted about, about these spaces? And, um, you know, if somebody decides to, you know, write a book about uh, cloud forests, they go on, you know, intrepid journeys, you know, to, uh, to rugged places. Um, you know, the, the reporting of these sorts of books is very much part of the ritual. Um, so, you know, where did, where did you end up? Uh, yeah, I did, you know, despite the fact that I like to stay home, I did have to leave it to go report the book. Um, but I went to look at interesting buildings um, all over the world. I went to uh, women's jail that was designed to sort of, or intended to be more humane, uh, that was out in San Diego. I went to see adaptive architecture. So this was sort of a fabric tent room that whose walls move when you breathe. So when you inhale, the walls of this tent expand like they're your lungs and when you exhale they contract. Um, that was in the UK. Um, I went to see a next generation operating room in South Carolina. I did a, a lot of traveling even though in theory this was a book about staying home in some ways. Yeah so um, maybe we could just uh, get back to what you mentioned about the microbiome because I'm mm -hmm. sure that's something that um, lots of people are wondering about. I mean you know, we hear about the microbiome as being, um, well, usually you, when you read about it, people are using the word to refer to like all the bacteria and other microbes that live inside of our bodies or on our bodies. Um, so you're talking about a microbiome where it's the sort of invisible life that we share our, our homes with or our buildings with, right? Yeah. And, you know, to be clear, it's a little... You know, it's sort of called the indoor microbiome, or lots of people refer to it that way. It's not quite the same thing as when we think about our own microbiomes, because what's interesting is a lot of the microbes that are surrounding us or in our homes, they're not necessarily alive. So we ourselves are huge sources of microbes in our environment. So a lot of what you find in your home are just sort of dead bacteria that we've shed from our bodies as we've moved through our homes. But there are also plenty of microbes that do actually live in our homes, whether it's, you know, in our house plants or in our pipes, or um, there are extremophiles uh, in our dishwashers. Uh, they seem to be hosting sort of unique forms of life that haven't been found anywhere else. So there's stuff evolving uh, right in our dishwashers. Um, so it's a real mix of microbes that we've introduced and things that are associated with the built environment. Right, and, and uh, showers have microbes in them too, right? They do. I got my own shower head sequenced. I got to participate in one of these census studies, and uh, I will not look at it the same way again. <laughs> well, how, I mean, um, should we, you know, look at our, our showers and dishwashers and walls and floors in, like, terror, like, where they're out to make us sick, or, or... Is there, or can we have a happy coexistence with all this invisible life that's surrounding us? Yeah, I mean, so that is a really important point. And, you know, it is not actually possible to have a sterile home, no matter how much you tried. And even if you could have one, you wouldn't want to. I mean, I think one of the nice things that the recognition of our own human microbiomes has done in recent years is it's made us realize how important microbes are to our own health. And like, our bodies wouldn't operate if it weren't for our microbes, microbial residents. Um, and so, yes, there are pathogens, there are molds that can be toxic or trigger allergies, but the vast majority of microbes in our homes are completely benign, and some may even be beneficial. So you really don't want to be, you know, Cloroxing the heck out of, out of all your surfaces. And, I mean, I guess all the interiors 
places that we go to are going to have bacteria as well. I mean, and that's going to be, I mean, that could be, I mean, if I'm in a hospital, I mean, that can be a particularly uh, a serious issue, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, there are some environments and even some circumstances, you know, I can understand right now why people might want to err more towards, you know, over eradication in their homes than normal when we have this pandemic going on. And certainly hospitals, you are more likely to have drug resistant bacteria. And then you also have a lot of people with compromised immune systems or open wounds. And so that's an environment where controlling the environmental microbes is really important. And you want to err more on the side of clean than of probably of rich microbial flora. I, I, I remember a few years ago writing an article for Wired where I went to um, the uh, NIH as a clinical hospital um, uh, on the grounds of NIH. And you know, they were dealing with this horrible outbreak of antibiotic resistant bacteria and it was hitting their patients. And um, what really blew me away was like, I mean, here they were, they were like literally on the campus of the National Institutes of Health and they were, they were struggling so much to figure out how these bacteria were getting around from floor to floor and room to room. And they would, you know, they'd find them in the, in the, in the sinks and places like where they would never guess they would be. And, and it, it just, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of sobering how, how these, these invisible things can get around these inside interior spaces so well. Yeah, I mean, and so buildings can definitely provide an infrastructure that allows these microbes to spread, whether it's through pipes or ventilation um, or, you know, a door handle. Um, you know, microbes have had a lot of time to evolve as well, and they're pretty good at evading our efforts to eradicate them. Now, you, you spend a lot of time in your book looking at one species in particular, Homo sapiens, and, mm -hmm. and in particular, um, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting how you, um, you know, you look at how our, our homes and other interior spaces can, um, you know, affect our health and, and even our, our minds. And I mean, is this, um, I mean, is, has, how long has this been sort of uh, been the subject of really like intense, serious scientific research? I mean, the, the idea that like, the what surrounds you in the, uh, in, inside these four walls actually can affect your mind. Yeah, well, so it has not been the subject of really rigorous research for a super long time. I mean, there have been studies here and there, but the birth of what's sometimes called evidence-based design um, is typically dates back to 1984. Uh, some people may have heard of this study. It's a classic, relatively famous study by Roger Ulrich that basically found that patients in hospital rooms that looked out onto nature used fewer painkillers and were discharged sooner than patients whose rooms looked out onto a brick wall. Um, mm -hmm. And he got this study, pretty simple study, but an elegant design and got it published in Science, which was a huge deal for a study like that. And it sort of made a splash and in the last few decades, we're seeing more and more of this research. It really picked up in the 90s. Um, that said, like, I don't want to imply that these are the first people to think about these relationships. You know, I talk about people like Florence Nightingale, or even you can go back to like the ancient Greeks who had an intuition that our environments affected us and got some things right, even though they didn't have, you know, peer reviewed literature to, to back up their ideas. So windows, good. Windows, what? good, but the details matter. Oh, really? Um, well, so like what you're, the view, what you're looking at matters and, you know, how much daylight's coming in matters, uh, how much fresh air is coming in matters. Uh, so yes, windows are good, but there are better windows and worse windows. Ah, I see, I see. And what, what else makes for a good, a good, a good indoors? Well, so the big number one recommendation I have for people and something that's pretty easy to add is nature. You know, I mentioned the nature views. So if you have windows that look out onto trees, that's great. Um, I don't. I, I live in Brooklyn, um, but I have a lot of houseplants and I got a lot more after doing um, the research for this book because nature seems to have almost any benefit you can think of both for body and mind in terms of reducing stress and anxiety, boosting focus and productivity. 
Um, even if, if houseplants are too much, uh, studies suggest that even like photos of nature or playing nature sounds in your indoor space can have some of the same benefits. So especially when we're all cooped up inside this winter, um, that's something I'd encourage people to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was, um, a few months ago, um, I, I wrote a, an article for the Times about um, air pollution and just like mm -hmm. what a just what a horrible, profound toll it takes on our sort of global public health. I mean, people don't really realize just how bad it is. And I guess I was pretty blown away by just how uh, bad uh, indoor air pollution can be, um, at, you know, especially in places where people are cooking indoors. And I'm, I'm just sort of curious what your what kind of things you, you learned, you know, looking at in terms of not just our mental health, but just the physical health of, you know, breathing in when you're inside? Yeah, I mean, so that was something that I didn't know either until I started researching this, which is that in part because of federal regulations, you know, our outdoor air, at least they're, you know, the regulations may be being loosened, but at least they exist. And <laughs> in general, there are not regulations. There certainly aren't federal regulations for indoor air. And because the air in a lot of places has gotten better, for many of us, our main exposure to air pollutants comes from our buildings. Um, so there are two main activities in particular that really are a big source of pollutants, and those are cooking and cleaning. And um, I have been thinking a lot about how, of course, those are the two things that we're probably all doing a lot more of uh, these days. Um, so human activities can generate air pollutants, but then also just what we have in our homes, our furniture, the paints we use, our flooring, a lot of those things, you know, give off or off gas chemicals that can be dangerous. Um, there are a lot of chemicals out there and some of them we don't know very much about, but we do know that some of them can definitely affect lung function, uh, heart function, lead to stroke, um, heart attack. Um, I'm not saying people shouldn't cook and clean, but these things do um, they are a source of, of chemical exposures for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, my understanding is that just um, if, if, you know, simple, um, you know, cook stoves that a lot of, you know, in places like a lot of countries like India, for example, if there could be just a few engineering designs to make a good cheap stove, like so many lives would be saved because, you know, people's homes will often just fill up with, with, a, with smoke and, and it's just such a, take such a toll on, on people. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a much bigger problem than, you know, what we typically have here in the US, but those cook stoves can be really, I mean, they're a huge cause of mortality. Um, my, just real quick, so I don't leave people feeling despairing. Yes. Um, my advice for, you know, please keep cooking and cleaning. Uh, even the experts I talked to said, I don't want people to stop cooking, but um, ventilation, 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 you know, use your range hood if you have it. We don't have one, but we have a window fan that we set to exhaust, um, turn those things on, and that will help a lot. So you um, sort of considered a lot of, in, you know, interesting places and, um, you know, for example, um, you know, prisons, for example, you mentioned making humane prisons. And so, um, you know, what, what kind of insights ha have scientists had about, you know, these, these you know, these indoor places where we put people for, for decades and, and what kind of, what kind, have there been like changes to the way prisons are built as a result? Yeah, prison design has a really interesting history and there's actually been several big waves of reform that were sort of motivated by trying to make prisons more quote unquote humane. And what's interesting to me is a lot of those either failed or backfired in ways that made them less humane. So the big example there is solitary confinement, which I think a lot of people now recognize is torture or akin to torture. It's one of the worst things you can do to a human being. Um, you know, after a few weeks in solitary confinement, people can begin to hallucinate and it just has these awful psychological effects. That actually began with the Quakers who were looking for like alternatives to you know, harsh punitive environments. And they mm. thought that like, if we give everyone their own cell that's quiet and where they can repent and reflect, it started as this idea to be like this more humane form of punishment. And then it became apparent that, you know, 
people were slowly developing all these devastating symptoms. So there have been a lot of waves of sort of efforts at reform that have not been very effective, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that sort of reminds me of, um, uh, in a way, of, of what it might be like to be on a space station, you know, where you're, you're so isolated. Um, I mean, obviously, there are some differences between prisons and, and space stations, but I mean, those issues of, of isolation and so on must be a pretty big uh, deal to, for, for astronauts to deal with there. Yeah, I mean, so there's a whole um, sort of area of research on sort of what's considered, I think they're called ICEs, isolated and confined environments. And basically, it lumps together research on prisons, space stations, like Antarctic research bases. Like these are three environments that on the surface seem extremely different, but create some similar challenges for human beings, whether that is you know, pulling people out of their social networks and removing their actual social supports. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, especially like in space crews, you're also throwing people in 24 seven, a small space with people they maybe didn't choose. And then there are also elements of like sensory deprivation where you're looking at the same, you know, gray wall or steel inside of the space station for weeks or months on end. Um, and that can cause stress and you know, physiological effects that accompany stress. Um, really severe sensory deprivation can cause hallucina hallucinations and things like that. But I don't think that's, that's not quite at the level of what we're talking about on the space station. But yeah, those environments are stressful. So do astronauts have ways of uh, managing that? Have they, have they found ways to, to uh, uh, you know, make, make those problems not quite so severe? Well, I mean, it is something that space organizations and NASA like are really cognizant of. And that is one reason there's so much research into it because it's a real like human factors problem. Um, I guess I don't want to bang on about the same thing, but nature. <laughs> um, and actually the Soviet space program was one of the first to really embrace and recognize the power of plants. And from the earliest days, they were sending up greenhouses and potted plants with astronauts. And, you know, some of that is for, you know, practical purposes to do experiments and grow food in space. But there have been a lot of interesting case studies or interviews with astronauts and cosmonauts saying like, these were our children, they would sleep by the greenhouses so they could see wow. the plants in the morning. The plant served as this like marker of time, you know, something that changed when nothing else was changing. Um, they can have really powerful psychological effects, and that's a big part of why plants and greenhouses go up to space, in addition to all the more practical research. I mean, we've, we've uh, in terms of like the most exotic kind of indoor spaces, I guess they would be kind of the ones in our dreams where we imagine, you know, moon bases or, or Martian colonies. And um, what's your sense of where people's thinking is on how we would live in indoor spaces on other worlds. Yeah, there's a lot of, that was really fun to research and there are a lot of interesting ideas. There are long, there's a long history of interesting ideas from, you know, like inflatables to domes made of ice. Um, ice is interesting because it allows you to still get daylight in, but it blocks a lot of the wavelengths of light that would be sort of the most dangerous form of radiation and would cause health problems. Mm. Um, but I mean, it's challenging because in addition to the psychological stress of being in space, you know, there are all these physical dangers from radiation to, you know, dust storms to meteorites. Um, and so I had one source, a space architect, tell me, you know, like he thinks it's ironic. We're going to fly in one day to Mars as like these overlords of the planet and then we're going to have to go live like cavemen for the rest of our <laughs> lives in these like very rudimentary um, shelters. Um, there's also some interesting thinking about like what next. So there's been a lot of research on like sort of a minimum viable product like a space shelter for a crew of six or something. But like if we're going to actually have a colony or something there, then we need places to gather and socialize and do we have like a mall on Mars or like you know what does that begin to look like um, 
So there are a lot of interesting ideas out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but, well, back on Earth, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think one of the you know, most intriguing uh, parts of the book was about um, sort of the special work that people were doing to adapt homes, buildings to people to, um, to suit the, the particular needs that they had. Um, so for example, people with autism. Uh, and I'm, I'm just curious what, you know, some of the most interesting things you found uh, researching that part of the book. Yeah, well, so I guess the first thing I'll say is that like, there's no such thing as like a one size fits all design, whether that's for someone for an autistic young adult or any of us. Um, so everyone has different needs and sensitivities. But what's interesting about a lot of people who have autism or migraines or epilepsy or sort of the whole universe of neurodiversity is that, um, how did one of my sources describe it? Oh, she said that, you know, a lot of times these people you can think of as sort of like, quote unquote, extreme users of the environment. So they can't tolerate basically some of the bad design decisions that the rest of us put up with. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're talking about a lot of autistic adults have sensitivities to sensory stimuli. So whether that's like flickering lights or sound or smells coming in from the apartment next door to you. And so designers who are designing for people on the spectrum often really take care to, about their lighting and the soundproofing and um, sealing you know, one apartment off from the other. And like, that's great and al might allow someone to function in a space where they otherwise couldn't. But those are also design decisions that I think all of us would appreciate. And yeah. so in some ways they're like pointing out some of the deficiencies in our built environment that we've just accepted as inevitable and, and maybe are not. Right, right. Someone made a decision about, you know, how much they were going to spend on, you know, the, the flooring right. in, in a building and, you know, and we're the ones having to listen to the footsteps above. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the other, when you start to think of like beyond private spaces into like, you know, whether it's a office or I don't know, a supermarket, like the idea of choice and control, is also really important because of the fact that we're all so different. So like to the extent that you can create different sort of micro environments and people can choose where to be based on their preferences and needs, that's sort of a, a good approach for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanna remind people uh, that um, they can um, post questions in the, in the question uh, little bubble at the bottom here. Um, I definitely wanna ask you a few more questions myself, but then I'll be happy to sort of uh, take a look at uh, the, the question box. So please everyone feel free to, to ask questions. Um, well, I guess one, one question I would have is, you know, did your ideas about the indoors change in any particular way? Did you sort of come in with certain ways of thinking about it and come out just with a different way of thinking? Well, yeah, so I have two answers to that question, I guess. One is even though sort of the premise of the book was that the indoor environment matters, there were still a lot of things that surprised me in terms of like invisible aspects of the environment, like the air temperature and how it might affect our cognitive performance and how that differs by gender and, you know, like that I had not thought about before. So like there were a lot of little insights like that that was like, oh, wow, like that makes a difference. Um, but I guess on a larger level, you know, I really went in with what seemed like a simple argument, which was that like the built environment matters. And so we, we just have to apply this knowledge and change the built environment and we can improve our lives. And like, I still think that parts of that are true, like absolutely redesigning our spaces can help improve our health and well being. But I also saw the limitations of that and that like, I mean, maybe it sounds obvious to everyone else now, but like redesigning a building or what some of my sources told me is sort of the hardware and that only gets you so far. And you have to pair that with social policies or economic policies or cultural change, or, you know, whether that's around decarceration or um, accessibility or affordability, whatever 
sort of issues you're talking about, like design can help and make new things possible, but it's not this silver bullet that's going to just be an easy solution. So that sort of nuance was something that came to me slowly as I started to visit some of these places. Was there a particular sort of design insight somebody had where you just thought like, oh my God, that is just so brilliant, so creative, something that particularly stood out? Interesting. Um, the first one that comes to mind, and this might not be something that is super uh, <laughs> applicable to everyone, but um, I went to visit a school in rural Virginia that was designed using the principles of sort of active design. Um, and so it was designed to sort of naturally nudge kids into being more physically active throughout the school day. Mm. And I was, there were a couple of um, sort of really playful and thoughtful touches that they put into the school. Um, so like one of the things we know is that even taking a few extra flights of stairs a day can have real benefits for our cardiovascular fitness. And so they'd like stuck up these huge superhero decals all up and down the stairs and sort of made a game of like the kids going up and down and high-fiving the superheroes. And they hid actual, in the tile floors, they like inlaid animal tracks. So kids could like walk around the school and look for tracks of different animals, which is also like an interesting learning opportunity. Right. Um, so there were little like really thoughtful, playful touches like that. You know, I don't know how one translates that to your home. <laughs> Um, but the, but the not, designers of that project were, did a really nice job. Yeah, it certainly sounds like a nice school to send your kids to. You know? Yeah. It sounds like they're, yeah, trying the public to... Public school, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I guess, you know, not, I mean, you know, whenever we're writing books, you know, we're writing them at one point of time, and then they get edited, and they get printed and then they, you know, they're ready for- the pandemic happens. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> like, you know, clearly you did not have in mind that like we would all be like, you know, very much like, you know, in, in our homes in a, in, a, in a very intense way when your book came out. But, um, but I, would, I would imagine that um, having, you know, um, thought so much and explored so much about the great indoors, as you put it, um, you would it would kind of affect the way that you've sort of seen our our whole experience our collective experience of, of the pandemic where we're just you know we're at home <laughs> all the time <laughs> I was, what, what have, what, what's that been like for you uh, well personally um you know in some ways my day-to-day -day life hasn't changed that much because i already worked from home um i mean of course, I also like went out to restaurants and to the gym and stuff that I don't do anymore. But in some ways, life feels the same. And of course, in other ways, emotionally, psychologically, life feels really different. Um, I've been surprised to find myself thinking, maybe it's not a surprise, but more about the sort of extreme environment research, like space um, and Antarctica more than anything else, just because mm. there's been a lot of research on psychologically, like how do people cope? Um, I think there are some interesting parallels and then also some things that are not parallel. You know, one thing that scientists have found is that there's this thing called the third quarter effect on these missions where about three quarters of the way through the mission, morale tends to take a dip because, you know, the first part of the year, it's exciting and something new and then you're at the halfway mark and you celebrate and it's halfway and then you get like 75 percent of the way through the mission and you're like oh god i'm so tired of this and i still have so much to go mm -hmm. but of course the problem right now is like we don't even know when that 75 percent mark is gonna hit and so it's like this kind of sort of indefinite confinement that mm. i don't know how much research has been done on it but i've been thinking a lot about like what does that do to the psyche to just not know how long we have to go? Um, yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, um, you know, I think a lot of people sort of look at, you know, vaccines as being that, you know, that, that, that marker where, okay, then it's all over. Right. And um, reporting on vaccines, uh, you know, I get people, including my own family saying like, so when does that happen? And, and I'm like, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I actually like for a while I was thinking 
the, my answer would be like, oh, January or February 2021. And then more recently, uh, I started saying like maybe June or July and that, that did not go over well. <laughs> um, because I was sort of, I think I was sort of changing that 75% that right. people who wanted to know my opinion were, were, were counting on. And, but, uh, yeah, but we're going to have, it's going to be, you know, certainly for, you know, places like, you know, in the Northeast where you and I live, I mean, it's, it's going to be a long winter indoors, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, I mean, I wonder, I'm just speculating, but I wonder if in some ways maybe that helped protect us psychologically too because I think if you'd told people like in March when we started to lock down that would still be here in late August with no end in sight I mean I think I might have felt a lot more despair at that moment you know it seemed more temporary so maybe seemed more doable um, but yeah it would be nice to tick off the days so are there things we can do to our indoor spaces as we're going to spend a lot more time in them um, in months to come? Yeah, I mean, I guess I won't harp on nature anymore. You guys get the idea. But um, similar to something that has a lot of the same benefits is daylight, especially in the winter mm. when it starts to be dark a lot. I mean, even getting one of those sad lamps, um, I think might be a good investment this winter. Um, you know, I think that the other thing I've been thinking about is there's been a lot of discussion about how to maintain our social relationships, which is important. Like we know as humans, we need that. Um, but there's been a lot less thought, I think, about the other side of the coin, which is privacy and personal space. And I know this doesn't apply to everyone, but like if you're sheltering in place or quarantined with other humans in a small space, like that can get aggravating. Um, and so there are some lessons. Suddenly, suddenly everyone is working from home. Yes. Kids are going to school from home. Exactly. And home gets a lot smaller. Right. And so one of the interesting things I've been thinking a lot about from a psychologist who studies uh, space crews is that um, privacy doesn't have to just be visual privacy. Mm. It can be something like auditory privacy. So even if you're like both in the living room in a one bedroom apartment, like putting on your own set of headphones and listening to a podcast or an audiobook or something that is just yours can create a bit of a feeling of space and bubble. And mm -hmm. like, that's an element of privacy that we might want to think about if when we're really feeling stir crazy this winter. Um, so yeah. that's an easy recommendation too. I mean, I also think about, you know, when we started talking about the microbiome, we now have mm -hmm. this new unwelcome uh, addition to our microbiome is this this coronavirus and and I mean the, I mean it, I I think like you know there there we 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 figure one of the key things we have figured out is the, the certain situations uh, conditions that uh, make uh, the possibility of like explosive super spreading events uh, really risky. One of them is the indoors. So, I mean, I, I'm sure lots of people are going to be thinking about the indoors in, in a new way in that respect. No, I've been thinking a lot about that irony of like this thing that is most dangerous and we are most at risk of when we're indoors is also forcing us to spend all our time indoors. Yeah, right. um, and, you know, it's a different, you know, it's like our homes instead of our offices, but it is, it's an interesting sense of humor that this virus has, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, certainly the the pattern that seems to be happening is that, um, you know, you get the really explosive events like at a bar, uh, in a place of worship, um, in, in some some place, some enclosed place where uh, like a call center, but then everybody goes home and the attack rate of people who share a house is really high. So, yeah. you know, you, you may not infect as many people coming home, but everybody in that house is at much higher risk. Um, so, but again, like you were saying before, like ventilation, that's, that's going to be huge, you know, even when it's cold out. And what's going to happen when all these colleges shut down and then send all of their students back home to live with their aging parents, you know, like that's going to be a nightmare. Um, so I don't know. I don't, maybe that's not the right uh, tone to end on, but <laughs> Everybody get a plant. Well, let, yeah. Let, let me, um, yeah, let me, so we've got, we've got a bunch of questions here. So let me just dive right in and people just can feel free to add, add more. Um, 
Uh, <laughs> so someone asks, um, uh, I have heard that, that no matter where you are, even indoors, you are never more than three feet from a spider. Any truth to that? We, we talked about in terms of the, the, you know, the, what you live with in your house, we only talked about the microbes, but there are plenty of animals that live in people's homes too, right? Yeah, I, so I don't know what the average distance is. I cannot speak to that. But some of the same researchers that did the study that found like roughly on average 2,000 types of bacteria in your home um, also found, did an insect survey of homes. And the short answer is there are a lot more there than you realize and that homes on average have about 100 different species of insects or are, I guess arthropods technically. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a lot, a lot more than you know. Um, I, would, I would be surprised if it's three feet. It might be even less than that. Ooh, wonderful, wonderful. But again, a lot of those are benign or even like when it comes to spiders, beneficial and are, you know, eating mosquitoes and things that we don't want in our homes so yeah, so there so there it's it's a predator prey ecosystem inside our house yeah and there are actually some cultures uh, i believe in central america and southeast asia where they deliberately introduce certain kinds of spiders to homes as a form of, of pest control um so you know especially you know in places where there are really dangerous diseases that are spread by mosquitoes so, mm. Mm. Um, don't fear the spiders. Don't fear the spiders. All right, except the black widows. I don't like yeah. that. Um, so how quickly uh, does indoor air become dirty or polluted? Um, like, so if, if we're if fresh air is coming into a, a home, like how long is it gonna take for the processes you were talking about to make it so that it is, can be risky? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that, and I'm not sure anyone quite does. Um, so there's the research on indoor air pollutants are, is really um, ramping up now. And so one thing that scientists have found is that like cooking, especially like on a gas stove over an open flame can produce spikes in particulate matter that are as bad as like what you see in the world's most polluted cities. Oof, but like when they've measured it, it lasts on the order typically of like minutes Whereas in these cities, it might be elevated for days or weeks. And right. so we don't have a real clear handle yet on like what danger that, you know, presumably that's less risky than having those levels elevated for days or weeks. But like the level of risk is sort of still unknown. It's, it's right. something that scientists are still studying. Uh, someone asked about ceilings. Um, is, there a, uh, is there a good ceiling height? Uh, you know, they... 10 to 12 feet, you know, like, a, you know, when we go into a place that has beautiful high ceilings, is that, uh, is, would that be good for our psychological health or any sort of other sort of health or does it not really matter? Well, so I only know of one study specifically that looked at ceiling height and it found that higher ceilings were good for creativity. And uh, I guess presumably because people felt less confined. Mm -hmm. um, I would think that high ceilings would be good from a sense of like feeling less stress and confinement. Um, one data point on boosting creativity, I'm not sure about beyond that. Yeah. What about, um, uh, so uh, there's another question that sort of brings up, um, sort of, we, we've been talking, you know, a lot about apartments and houses, um, you know, the sort of 21st century Western type of abode, but you know, what about uh, igloos, yurts? Caves, you know, like what uh, you know, did you did you do any research on on these other other kinds of shelters? Um, I talked about them a little from two perspectives. Uh, one is the microbiome perspective. So there have been some interesting studies that have looked at sort of um, dwellings on the spectrum of what you might call like modernization, from like jungle huts to like super urban apartment buildings and found that they're basically like gradients of environmental microbes. So sort of the more quote unquote like modern, our homes are, you know, these glass towers and stuff are really dominated by our own human microbes. Whereas when you get to homes that are more open and might have thatched roofs and um, things like that, then they have allow a lot more environmental microbes in. Mm -hmm. um, 
the other place I looked at them a little bit is from the point of view of sustainability and some architects now looking towards these types of dwelling for lessons for resilience and sustainability because mm -hmm. you know there are these cultures that have been building shelters from extreme environments for millennia and it doesn't necessarily have to be like a smart thermostat you know that right. makes it sustainable so there's some interesting lessons there yeah yeah i've always been struck by um um you know sort of housing in some places where you know flooding is is very common and and um you know in some cases people just you know, they're just able to rebuild their house very quickly. You know, they just, they, they, that it's not a big deal that your house gets flooded out. And, and then in other cases, obviously, there are these amazing things where you're able to sort of have your house, uh, you know, be above the waters or, or I think I've even heard of somewhere like they're kind of, they can actually like kind of rise up and come down. Sort That's of in the book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the amphibious uh, foundations. So the, are these things that are really being built? Um, yes, though, I mean, at least in the case of amphibious architecture, like not wi widely, like there are a handful of these houses around the world um, and interest in building more, but it's still a little bit of a, or a lot of bit of a, a niche <laughs> approach. So um, speaking of uh, different kinds of housing, we have a question here. Um, so. Uh, uh, I'll just read the part of it. So it would obviously be ideal, one supposes, if every unique individual had at least uh, a private indoor space perfectly suited to them. So who pays for this? Rich people get this because they can afford it. What about everybody else? Uh, what about the cost of some of these things you suggested for so-called affordable housing? So, so um, do, do you, uh, you know, are, the, are these kinds of things that uh, science can show us can really, you know, help our state of mind indoors? Are these going to be limited to the people who can have a super nice house and fit it out to, to, to specifications at great cost? Well, I certainly hope not. And I did try in the book to address some of that head on and to talk about how, you know, if you think about something like sustainability, like, if it's this a million dollar house with all these fancy smart features, like that's not really going to get us very far because that's not accessible. Um, so I guess there are two points there. One is that I think a lot of these features pay for themselves, you know, like in terms of as a society, you know, if we create healthier buildings, then we are reducing the burden of disease. Um, but the other thing is that's partly where the sort of cultural change I talk about comes in and sort of we reach the limits of built environments like we know how to build healthier housing for people, but do we have the political will to do that and to pass those regulations um, and to increase like housing vou like vouchers like we need all those things alongside the evidence. Um, right. right. But, I mean, we, we know how to do it if we decide to make it a priority. Right. Um, totally different uh, uh, question here. Uh, what's your take on marketing in architecture? Example, red is the most heavily used by fast food chains, followed by yellow and orange, a color combination that, according to studies, evokes hunger. So, um, you know, ha are, 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 are the colors uh, and the kinds of, you know, other details of architecture that surround us in commercial spaces, are they being, are we being manipulated by them? Um, well, almost certainly uh, companies are trying to manipulate you. <laughs> um, how well that works, I think, varies. And I mean, there's a ton of research for reasons you can imagine on retail experiences and retail spaces. Some of it is more solid than others. I think I didn't talk much about color because I thought the color literature was kind of weak. Oh, really? um, but there is, you know, stuff like noise and in restaurants and how it can make people eat faster or, you know, some people theorize that it uh, helps tables turn over faster because people don't want to stay if they can't hear. <laughs> I mean, I didn't go too far down any of those roads because it was hard to separate sometimes. So like which of these claims are marketing and which are really rigorous, but um, definitely stores are interested in, are actively thinking about their design in those terms, whether it's working or not is a little harder to say. Yeah, I think as journalists, I think we notice sometimes like um, a, a lot of these 
studies and the stories about these studies, they're, they're, you kind of notice sometimes that uh, they're being performed or, or paid for by, by the very companies that are, you know, wanting to promote something. So yeah, it's, it's right. Or there's one study that says red stimulates your ap appetite and another one that seems similar that it depresses it. And, but those mm -hmm. are the only two studies and like it, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really good research being done, but there's also a lot of questionable research being done. <laughs> Um, someone wants to know, um, in having written The Great Indoors, how have you changed your workspace? Are there things that you have changed to improve your well-being and work performance as a journalist? Um, I mean, the big thing I've done is plants, which I, I won't, I, I had a few plants. What, what kind of plants do you have? Tell us. Well, so, I don't know, they're probably hard to see. Um, I have a lot of uh, like succulents and also Z's. I recommend ZZ plants. If any, look up two Z's, ZZ plant. Oh, yeah. um, they're lovely and leafy, but they're sort of unkillable, um, <laughs> which I appreciate. I have started my like only quarantine hobby so far is growing microgreens, which I've kind of mm. gotten into. Um, I also recommend them for beginner gardeners um, who only have windowsills because they're pretty easy and you can also harvest them like five to seven days after you plant them. So like if you're impatient like me, um, it's a good choice. Um, those so are the- like a, You're like an indoor farmer now. I would, I mean, I would love real outdoor space to like grow actual vegetables. Uh, right now I'm limited to like herbs and sprouts. No, no, but actually, I mean, have you heard, I, I, I can't remember if this was in the book or not, but like vertical farming is like becoming this thing now, you know? Yeah. Like maybe you could actually like just instead of having a farm laid out flat, you actually put it in a building and like it could be incredibly efficient. Yeah, I need to get a lot better at keeping things alive for <laughs> I, I go to that level of investment. Okay. But um, okay. yeah. So uh, here's a question actually, which is, I appreciate because I, I didn't get a chance to follow up on this when you mentioned it. Um, you, can you elaborate on the impact of indoor air temperature on cognition? Oh, yeah. Uh, what, so yeah. So what, what, what should, we, should we be setting our thermostat to so we can be totally sharp? Yeah, so this is one of my favorite um, sort of pieces of trivia from the book. Um, and so that, again, there's no ideal temperature for everyone. Preferences vary a lot. Um, in general, though, women are more sensitive to air temperature and they tend to mm -hmm. perform, prefer warmer air temperature. But what I find really fascinating is that it's not just a matter of comfort, that women actually perform better on cognitive tasks when the air is warmer and men perform better when it's cooler. Mm -hmm. And what's even extra interesting, if I can like add another superlative, is that the toll, let's, this is always confusing to say, when the air temperature is too cold, women suffer more cognitively than men do when the temperature is too high. Hmm. Basic and and you know probably surprising no one most offices are calibrated to men's thermal preferences uh -huh. you know like <laughs> if you've been in an office you've probably seen women with cardigans and shawls in the summer I have been one of those women um, and the evidence suggests that we should actually turn office temperatures up a few degrees and that sort of the gains for women will outweigh the slight losses for men. Um, that may be a hard sell, but um, I think that's really interesting. Mm. So have you uh, set your thermostat to a finely tuned, cognitively optimal temperature? I live in a New York apartment. We don't have a thermostat. <laughs> but all New York apartments are incredibly overheated, right? So you, you it's must- It's hot be in winter, yeah. And then we just have like two little window units that are like really trying hard to keep up right now. <laughs> um, oh dear. Yeah. Um, here's a question, um, how, ha, ha, have you looked at how air flows through a lot of American homes coming from Europe? I continue to be annoyed that my apartment can't get cross breezes because all the windows are on one outside wall. Does that impact the microbiome at all? And I have to say like, um, last summer, um, took my family to, to Paris and we just had a lovely time there, but it was. It was hot. It was during the heat wave. 
no air conditioning in this, you know, uh, apartment we were staying in. But, you know, we, we were able to just open the windows wide and that, that certainly helped. But it definitely does give you a feeling that like culturally, uh, even into sort of Western uh, nations like France, and the United States, just these, these, these sort of decisions about like, how will the air move through your, your house or can be really profoundly different. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about like window positioning. That would be a really interesting thing to explore. I mean, it wouldn't shock me because Americans are pretty like reliant on air conditioning in a way that, as you say, like people in lots of other countries aren't. Um, so I wouldn't be shocked to see um, less of that here. I mean, the other thing I think about is like most commercial buildings here don't even have operable windows, period. Um, that's mm -hmm. something I'd love to see change is, you mm -hmm. know, actual windows that can be opened because uh, very few offices even have those. Yeah. Yeah. And actually like with the pandemic, I mean, right. there have been really specific, I've seen specific recommendations, you know, that, um, uh, from, from experts on, on, on the disease and on ventilation saying offices need to keep, need to keep windows open, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's too hot or too cold, because like that is going to be key. Yeah. So we shall see if, if they'll do that. I mean, I, um, I was reading how in some schools, they, they can't do that. They can't even open their doors to their classrooms because they have all these rules about shooters. Yeah. You know? So we have certain conflicts there. Yeah. The virus is a, a lot more of a risk than, uh, than, than a shooter. Anyway, I'm getting, I'm, so here's an interesting question. With humans living in built houses for at least several thousand years, are there any identifiable ways, identifiable ways that dwelling in buildings has influenced our evolution as a species or might in the future? Are we adapting to our, our indoor environment? So that's a really great question. The, the, there are not any identifiable ways that I am aware of yet, but I think it's certainly possible and I, speculate about that a little bit in the book because we know we have examples from bacteria and insects that now basically only live in human buildings and have evolved inside human buildings away from their outdoor counterparts. So it's certainly a mechanism that happens. Um, you know, like German cockroaches and bed bugs, for instance, are two species that basically only live in human dwellings or human buildings. Um, and other insects that live indoors, we are seeing them evolve away from their counterparts. Um, I suspect we may need more generations um, and it's hard to predict what those changes will be, but we know that it's theoretically possible from the, from the insect data. Right. Um, so I'll just, uh, we, we have several questions, but I'll just ask one more. Um, Still more, yeah. Okay. Um, what do you think about, uh, what do you think of the open, open space office design with regards to physical and mental well-being. So, you know, open office versus cubicles, like what's, what's going to be least likely to drive us nuts? Um, I guess the good news and the bad news, depending on your perspective, is that the open office is pretty unequivocally bad for us in every way, really? except for, you know, the bottom line of companies that are creating them, uh, <laughs> which is why they're so popular. Um, but, you know, everything from physical health, I mean, for reasons you can imagine, if you think about the pandemic, you know, when we're all in a big open space, it's a lot easier for us to pass germs to each other. Um, the noise is distracting, the visual thing outside our field is distracting. Some scientists and uh, designers had theorized that they might be better for sort of collaboration and cooperation. Mm -hmm. And even the research on that is mixed to negative. Um, I mean, it seems like at least in some offices, if you tear down the walls, people actually have fewer face-to-face -face conversations because there's no privacy and people are worried about disturbing their colleagues. So, um, you know, I guess the good news, if you want to spin it that way, is like you can tell your bosses that science pretty clearly supports giving us walls back. Um, I don't know. What difference it'll make but you know there's people are speculating that maybe the pandemic will help uh, at least make some people rethink the open office yeah. uh, it, i think there'll be a lot of rethinking going on let's hope so 
Um, sorry, I just want to say if I didn't get to your question, like I'm on Twitter or my email is also available, like feel free to reach out with your question. I'm happy to take more of them another time. That's wonderful. I think this, um, your work definitely prompts new ideas and questions. I am currently rethinking my whole existence <laughs> and I love it. Um, thank you, Emily and Carl for your time and for joining us for this really fantastic conversation. This was so much fun. And thank you, all of you out there at home who are tuning in tonight and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. If you'd like to support Emily and the bookstore, there are links in the chat where you can purchase the book or donate. Um, go ahead and do that. It's the great indoors. It's fantastic. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Thank you again so much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>